Let me ask you a question. Who in this room right now is an expert on the Affordable Care Act? Yes, yes. I knew that Brian was. I knew that Brian was. You know, being in the banking industry, you would be an expert on the Affordable Care Act. I know Absolutely no doubt. I, know I have to tell you that when I put this presentation together, I did it, you guys are completely safe in this class, because I did it from the uh, Dairy for Dummies manual. That would be my name. And uh, I actually am a healthcare consultant as well. Uh, with uh, it, I own my own business actually, but I've been in a very diverse role in healthcare, starting in checkout and kind of doing a lot of what a lot of you folks coding, billing, compliance, the whole avenue. But being a person that started on the inside and moved up, so you know what the Affordable Care Act confused me. And I was like, you know, it's about time somebody really started to give an overview of what the true rules are. Um, I don't, let me just ask one more question. Raise your hand if you trust everything you see on TV. <laughs> Do they even know what the rules are? Um, well, they do, but since they keep changing them, it is a moving target. <laughs> so I got to tell you that the good thing about the Affordable Care Act is if you were ever questioning uh, the viability of our industry, I can assure you, you have to question no more. Like you and coding, for instance, right? I, you never really had to before, but the Affordable Care Act just opens it up even more. What I want to talk about, though, is I want to talk about some of the costs and those types of things that a lot of people just don't understand this. And I actually did use a dummies manual for this. So I want to let you know, and with the accent, you should be even less worried about it, right? Because we know it's going to be, you know, at least sort of where you'll understand it from that perspective, broad range. So what we're going to talk about is the stated goals of Obamacare. I'm going to call it Obamacare because I'm from Kentucky. And the Affordable Care Act is just way too long. And ACA, I might say ACA a couple of times, but I'll either say Obamacare or ACA, OK, because they're shorter. We always condense everything. Groups impacted by Obamacare, health care exchange structure, required elements of Obamacare exchanges, other financial impacts on coding reimbursement physicians and reporting requirements, and delays in regulatory controls because you asked, right? So we're going to go over costs and all of that stuff and some of the confusing things and clarify what ACA is really about. Now, I want to tell you something else. I am not here to say good or bad. I'm not even here to discuss that. What I want to explain to you is facts. And you know what? You can take the facts and draw from them whatever you want to draw from them, OK? So facts are facts. You remember this little guy? I love him. I'm just a bill. Yeah, I like that. You know you can actually Google this. You, you can. You can actually Google the whole video, which is pretty cool. Um, what were they called? I know, it's crazy, but you know what? It's, that's, I told you, I'm a humble little lady. So, so the, uh, the, afford the Affordable Care Act, uh, Obamacare includes the Patient Protection, now listen to this, Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act and the Health Care and Education Reconciliation Act. What do they have to do with each other? All right, there's a start right there, right? Education and health care. Hmm. But that's what the entire bill is called, okay? Shortened version, ACA. They were both passed in 2010, and they both had components of the healthcare elements within them, okay? These two bills change how healthcare functions in the United States. You know what? Here, what was the goal of ACA? Somebody, I mean ACA. What was the goal? Anybody know? Why did we do it? Get patients involved in their care. One good reason. What was the main driver for... Affordable health care, what else? Covering the uninsured, right? We talked about covering the uninsured. You know how many people were uninsured? I know that number is kind of a moving target too. Like, it depends on who you watch on TV, right? Or it depends on which congressman you're watching on TV or whatever the case may be. That moving target, the whole thing is, is the entire health care structure is going to change for potentially 15% of our population. Now that should tell you something. Because if 15% of our population for people that can't afford insurance, why don't we focus on the 15% when you're talking about 20% of our entire uh, uh, income or, or, or how big healthcare is actually, 20% of our gross domestic product, okay? So you know what, if we were really worried about care, affordability, all of those things, we probably wouldn't have changed the entire healthcare system that worked 86% of it employer mandate, uh, employers, all that. Most of our insurance is paid by our employers. And I know less people are employed now. We've had Medicaid 
for people, you know, basically that, that and we're going to talk about some of the state exchanges and the ways that different states decided to do things. I can focus on Florida here, right? Okay, that's always a good thing. But the thing is, is basically it was for affordable care and it was to, to cover the uninsured, okay? But again, we've taken now 100% of our health care and we're trying to fit everybody into that. Now we have potentially, and I can tell you from statistics, more people uninsured. And even by 2022, the entire 30 million last estimate that I heard still will not have insurance, okay? And we'll talk about the reasons why. Now, and I'm going to tell you something, that those 30 million, they are estimates by the Congressional Budget Office and people that actually implemented this. They are not my statistics. I don't just throw out statistics that aren't supported. So, for the insured and uninsured statistics prior to passing the Patient Responsibility and Affordable Care Act, there were 164 million, look at the numbers, these are facts, okay? 164 million got their insurance through work, 14 million bought policies on their own. There are people that actually paid for insurance, okay? I'm not sure why we even touched them. Because if employers were paying, wait until you get now when your employer's not paying, right? Or when your employer gets rid of you, okay? Um, as far as the insurance policy. 49 million had no insurance. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I've heard 30, I've heard 25, I've heard 10. We talked about data earlier. Where the heck do they get this stuff, okay? 42 million are on Medicaid. How's that working out for you? In the state of Florida, almost nobody takes Medicaid anymore, okay, from a broad perspective. I say that, look at that number, because of the fact when we talk about the, expa uh, the uh, expansion and the healthcare exchanges, much of it is Medicaid related. Well, my gosh, if the current Medicaid patients can't get help, if we're gonna, if we're gonna up the standards so that more people can get on it, you know, for some of those folks that are really upset about whether you expanded your Medicaid program or not, which we're gonna talk about for the Affordable Care Act, every state had to make a decision. Um, I think that we're in a pretty good darn position at this point because we decided not to expand our Medicaid program. And that was well before October 1st when the entire exchange kind of blew up, right? And more people are on Medicaid now than anything else. And had we expanded it, I'll tell you what the cost to the states would be. Okay, and 39 million people are on Medicare. Okay, so look at those statistics before. Oh, I did it right, Kathy, look at that. So, in 2012, the percent of insured and uninsured statistics for non-elderly. So again, 55.7% are employer-sponsored. Medicaid and other public assistance was 20.8%. The uninsured was 17.7%. Private non-group was 5.8%. And that just gives you the statistics overall. Again, another, you know, these are, these are valid statistics that are put out by the folks that actually created the Affordable Care Act. Stated goals and implementation. Now, we have to say stated goals because we have to first talk about what were the goals, right? Where were we going to be financially? What was going to be helped, et cetera, et cetera. So it was to provide better access to health care for an estimated 37 million Americans without insurance. It just went up again, didn't it? Haven't I had three different... There was 49 million a minute ago. 49 million, okay. Now, again, yeah, we, that's right. And we talked earlier about data. Where do you get the data? And guess what? Depending on if it's popular or if it's not, the data changes, right? Suddenly, yeah, anyway, I won't go there. Okay, control and eventually reduce health care costs. Control health care costs. Hmm. We're going to talk about that. Do you think that's going to work? No. No. Why not? Okay. I'll tell you why. Chirp, chirp, chirp. <laughs> okay, so provision of additional benefits and protections for all insured. There are those little freebies. Okay, so, you know, Brian, I just want to know how do you feel about paying for women to have babies? Just want to know. And Paula, you know, I know you always wanted to pay for that Viagra for those guys. <laughs> yeah, that was really important for us. Now we're all in the same pool, right? We all pay for everybody, okay? So that in itself, just with the freebies, I don't know. I, it's, this is what I was saying about the camera. I got to tell you, maybe the representative for being able to get free pills or not shouldn't be going to Harvard. I don't know. It just kind of scares me that that's the person that was in the forefront for some freebies. If you're going to Harvard and can't afford your pills, we got problems. Okay? But again, freebies. And I'm telling you, it's not just the pill. 
preventative care, okay? Preventative care is a great thing, but how many Medicare patients actually are not sick? Exactly. Who, who was the one insurance before ACA that did not pay for preventative care? Medicare. Everybody else pays for it. HMOs pay for it, everybody else pays for it. Now there's some good things. Um, we'll talk about some of those. Well, there are some good things about it, like no pre-existing conditions and things like that, but you have to understand the risk pools that you're getting involved in for those no risk. And a lot of those patients, those six million or eight million, I'm not even sure what the statistic is, because it keeps changing, but the six to eight million that actually lost their insurance that were paying for good plans because they were sick, now there, a lot of them have lost their doctors and things. Can you imagine if you had cancer and you were going to the same doctor for 10 years, it might be a little important for me. Or your kid has been treated by the same doctor for a chronic illness. So those kind of things, you know, pre-existing, while it sounds wonderful, you know, you can't get turned down for pre-existing, who's gonna pay for that? And especially with all the people that used to pay, now a lot of them don't have to pay anymore, right? So you have to think about all those things. Additional provisions to assist consumers by covering preventative care, enhancing long-term care services, providing a number of other ideas for enhancing efficiency and reducing costs in healthcare. Reducing costs, hmm, well, I haven't seen it yet, right? So again, you know what, this is what, this is actually, pre, this is probably not even up there anymore, so y'all might want a <laughs> copy of this slide, right? Insurance companies no longer have unchecked powers. Oh, those evil insurance companies. I'm gonna tell you in five or six years, we are gonna wish we still had relationships with those people. I gotta tell, and I, got, I have to tell you, a lot of us have complained about them in the industry, okay? Now, you know, those evil employers are coming up soon <laughs> that don't take care of anything. So a lot, you know, those bad insurance companies, if you can blame somebody, it makes it easier for people to accept the big change, right? Soon no American will ever again be denied care or charged more for a pre-existing condition like cancer or even asthma. How can you tell me I'm not gonna be charged more? You know, the only cost that we're talking about with the Affordable Care Act is your monthly premium. We haven't talked about deductibles. We haven't talked about co-pays. We haven't talked about all those other areas. Have you guys heard anything about that? I keep hearing about what I'm gonna pay per month, not what I gotta pay out of pocket, right? Or, or that little fine print like our car insurance company tells us, right? You get a little ding and all of a sudden it all goes up, right? And you've been paying for 800 years and never had an accident your whole life. Okay, maybe not 800 years. And I hope you have preventative care if you're 800 years old, because I know that'll be beneficial. <laughs> preventative care will still be covered free of charge by insurance company, including wellness for mammograms, wellness visits for seniors. That is interesting. Wellness visits, I just, I just don't get it. I'm sorry, maybe I'm just a stupid Kentucky girl. By August, millions of Americans will receive a rebate because their insurance company spent too much of their premium on administrative costs or CEO bonuses. Did y'all hear about that? That they got rich? Ask me how much is the most I've talked to anybody about the rebate. Individual. Now, I don't know about y'all. I don't care what four, 350, 349 million other Americans get or don't get. When I hear rebate, is my check going to get me a new iPod? Okay, just want to know. There has not been one person that's gotten more than a $150 check from that, okay? So when you're splitting it with three quarters of the American population, okay? And by the way, you don't get it next year, so don't look for it, okay? 5.3 million seniors will continue to save 600 per year on prescriptions. Here's what I wanna say to you. You know what that includes? You have to be on Medicare D. How many of your parents don't pay for Medicare D because they can't afford it? They pay cash. They're not included in that. So it's not reducing anything for me if I'm not on Medicare D. I can tell you my parents don't have it, and they're both Medicare aging. And they pay a fortune for their prescriptions, but they can't afford Medicare Part D, okay? So efforts to strengthen and protect Medicare by cracking down on fraud, waste, and abuse will remain in place. Oh, I just said the F word in public. I'm so sorry, I usually don't do that. You were supposed to catch me. Oh, catch me, I'm falling. There is a song about that, by the way. I think I'm giving myself away there. Okay, oh, that's just wonderful, thank you. Just what I want the Affordable Care Act to do, come after those bad doctors that are all committing the F word. Mm -hmm. uh, because you know what, it's almost every doctor that exists. They're just bad dudes, okay? That's gonna save me a lot. Wait till you hear how we're paying for all this, by the way. 6.6 .6 million young adults will be able to stay on their family's plan until they're 16, okay, look. 
26. It would have been nicer if it was 16, but I need to be very clear here. I have a 21-year-old, okay? I have a 16-year-old. My 21-year-old looked at me when she heard this, and I went, don't even think about it. Because as far as I'm concerned, when you turned 18, you said you wanted to be an adult. You are one. Pay for your own dang insurance. Now, this is wonderful for people who have disabled children and things like that. Absolutely a positive. But I'm going to tell you, I've met the people with disabled, and I'm going to tell you their daggone premiums are sky high. Okay? So that means my premium's just sky high until they're 26. I mean, pre-existing's great if it works for what it's intended to work for. The 26-year-old, but why on earth would you tell our healthy population that a kid's still a kid, still a kid at 26? Right. Timeline of ACA implementation. So here's some things that haven't gone through yet, believe it or not. This was supposed to be our big year. The health insurance exchanges, we all know about those. We'll talk about those in a minute. That worked out really well. I'm so, so, so glad that, you know, we have the right people in charge that, you know, we effectively can even sign up for insurance. Now they're the ones that are going to be running the whole thing. Can't wait to see it. Health insurance exchanges select carriers in 2013. This is the big year, you know. We did put a couple of things off, like maybe 43 provisions, but don't worry about it. Not, not a problem. State health insurance exchanges must be financially self-sufficient in 2015. Uh, you know, some of those uh, state exchanges, you know how much money they've already, and now they're clamoring. They're all going, oh, we can't do this. We can't afford it. Well, you know what? There is no self-sufficient, financially stable state exchange, okay? Wait until I tell you some other things that are very new in the last three weeks. 2016 small employer definition changes to 100 or fewer employees. That makes it harder. Like, you got it. You got it. Oh, yippee. Can't wait for that one either. 2017, states can open health insurance exchanges to large employers. Why? If I can't get it right the way it is now, how am I going to get it right then? Oh, let's just expand it. It ought to work right. This one right here. Anybody know? You've heard this word, right? The Cadillac tax? Yeah, have you heard that on TV? No? Here's what the Cadillac tax is, which is why, exactly why your employers are about to get rid of half of you. Okay? Cadillac taxes are people that basically actually pay a higher amount for their insurance because they get more benefits, right? What's going to happen is the employers that give them these big expensive insurance policies that patients are willing to pay for, okay? They're going to get a 40% tax if that patient spends more than a certain amount of money on an annual basis. Wait, let me tell you what it is now. Zero. From zero to 40 in 2018, you're going to start hearing it. We've already started hearing it on TV. Right now, employers are getting rid of way before 2018. See, folks, it doesn't really matter if this goes through 100%. We are so changing the structure of health care because people have to prepare for it. I mean, I know the government doesn't prepare for much, but my point is you have to prepare for this. An employer can't sit around for two years and guess if this is going to happen or not. Okay? So this... In the next couple of years, the employer mandate, you know, was put off until after the political environment that we're in right now, right? 2014. So the employer mandate will come through next year. That's going to be killer, right? And you, you all know that you're, you only have to work 30 hours a week now. You do know that, right? You can go learn photography and you can learn how to paint and you guys can learn whatever you want in your spare time. Don't worry about those bills like your mortgage and all that stuff. Don't worry about it. And you know what? No added expense for health care because now it's going to be affordable. Groups impacted by Obamacare. We're going to go through the individual groups. So impact on insured patients. Well, we, we're going to give you increased goodies, increased prices. You know what? You can't get anything for free. Didn't, didn't our parents raise us telling us that? Nope. Nothing's free, right? It's not free. Raising prices may push employers to drop coverage. We're already seeing that, okay? Penalty with, uh, to withdraw from a non-health related purchase from health savings account increases to 20%. Listen, in health savings accounts, we used to be able to save up to $5,000 for our health insurance. They lowered it to $2,500. Why do you do that? If people are willing to pay, pay. These are paying customers. But we want to stick them all on Medicaid. Okay? Yeah, that's just the answer. There, let's. Hey, at least the uninsured are taken care of. But again... The 30 million doesn't change between now and 2022. That was before all of this. That was before the put everything off, right? That's huge. 
Cap for contribution of employer to flex spending account, 2,500, capped it. Can't, can't use more than that, can't save more than that. Medicare benefits shrink due to spending cuts. Now, benefits shrink. Look, for those people that told you back in the day when this was going through that there was not gonna be an effect on Medicare, I'm not talking about death panels or anything. I'm not even going there. Here's what I'm gonna talk about. I can assure you, you know how this is paid for? Medicare cuts. It started out something up to $500 billion. It's up to 728, almost a trillion dollars already and everything hasn't been mandated and implemented yet. Medicare cuts, Medicare cuts, okay? I'm not talking about Medicare Advantage, you know, those people that pay more because we don't want them doing that, you know? It's gotta be fair. If you like your health care, you know what? Y'all have heard this a million times on TV. I'm gonna tell you right now, you can't keep it. When you put on the exchanges only so many doctors, right? You got one pediatrician in a major area. You got one pediatrician, and I'm talking where there's a million pedi pediatric doctors or there's a million orthopedics. No competition. You put one guy on your plan because he's the one that shook your hand and took the deal. Or this insurance company shook your hand and took the deal. And all the rest of us that didn't, where are all those patients gonna go? Oh, and by the way, those 30 million, how many more are we gonna have that we're gonna be covering now? Right? Hmm. Remember the ER thing? What do you think the chances are that we're not gonna go to the ER anymore? I'm gonna tell you right now, that's spiking right back up. You know why? Guess who's not covered under this? People that aren't legal in this country. They're not covered. Who are the two biggest, you tell me, who are the two biggest population that go into the emergency room? Big, biggest population that don't need the treatment, that go for bogus reasons. People, people that don't have insurance, right? Who else? Medicaid. Medicaid. Medicaid patients, drug seekers, you know, because an ER doctor, they'll get a different one every time so nobody can track what they're doing, right? They're not gonna be fair and civil about it and go to their primary care doctor who says no more. Right? What are you encouraging? I mean, our ER visits are not going to go down. And with people that can't get insurance because of the Affordable Care Act, like uh, immigrants that aren't legal, if they can't, where are they going to go? The only place legally that we can take care of them that we can't turn them away is the emergency room. How is it going to go down? You can insure the whole patient population and it still wouldn't go down. Right? But for these reasons, it definitely won't. Impact on uninsured patients. Uninsured low income may enroll in Medicaid or subsidized insurance plan through a state exchange or a federal exchange. Uninsured will be required. Listen, listen, uninsured, okay? Why do you think a lot of people are uninsured? Because they just flat can't afford it. It's not that they don't want insurance. Okay, so if I have uninsured and I can't afford it, now you're gonna charge me a premium. <laughs> you're gonna charge me a copay. And did you all hear about the fact that Walmart's thinking about opening up clinics in Walmart? Uh, yeah. What do you, yeah, they, uh, they have in, yeah, they've start, they started to sample it. Yeah, Walgreens. primary care. If I can't afford insurance, how am I gonna afford 40 bucks to come see you? And oh, by the way, I just wanna know, are they gonna file your claim? They're gonna take on those administrative costs? Woo, are they in for some trouble? While thought is that because of the size of the group of insured who will be purchasing exchange, remember the, the thing was, is now people will be able to afford it, more people will get into it, okay? Now, I gotta say that the whole exchanges and the sign up and all that, you couldn't have done a worse thing than for the technological savvy age not be able to get a daggone insurance exchange program that I could just go in, type my name, get a list of things, and have the issues they had. I mean, because if you think those people are gonna come out, I just loved it on TV, I'm thinking about my kids, you know, that everything is yesterday. It's got to be done yesterday, okay? I'm on a roll. Mom, I'm getting my text. Mom, yeah, you're, come back in two hours and we'll be ready for you. And then they get kicked out again two hours. Really? Do you really think those people that were supposed to pay for all of this, that were supposed to balance all of it out, the 18 to 30-something year olds were going to sign up for this once they saw that didn't work one time? Okay, all those promises. What's the impact on Medicare patients? Medicare benefits added for prescription assistance and preventative care. Again, we already talked about the preventative care, ha, ha. We already talked about prescription. That only helps the people that are part of the Part D program. All right, so if you don't pay for that, that doesn't help you for prescriptions at all, okay? Cuts in Medicare of more than 507 billion from 2012 to 2021, that's old data. It's already gone up to 798 mil, uh, 
798 billion, okay? And remember, 43 delays. And so the employer mandate hasn't gone through. Look at all the passes. You know, what makes McDonald's any different than me? I own a business. Can you give me a break? They didn't get rid of my individual mandate. We all still have to pay a fine at the end of the year, right? You know, what's up with that? We have no lobby power. We didn't even actually get a choice of whether we wanted this or not, right? Taxes. Remember you heard on TV, no taxes, no ta oh, no taxes. Look, I'm going to give you three pages of taxes, okay? 40% excise tax starts in 2008 on Cadillac premiums. If a Cadillac premium exceeds spending $10,200 a year and $27,500 for families, $10,200 a year for an individual, $27,500 for a family, they get taxed 40%, from zero to 40%. That is nuts, okay? So when your employer says we're not going to do it anymore, you'll know why. Don't blame the evil employer, okay? They're being, this is a mandate. Employer or employee taxes over 50 employees, you have to either insure your employees or pay a penalty. The penalty is 2,000 an employee and 3,000 if they use tax credits to purchase insurance on the exchange. What? Why are we getting rid of the paying customers? I mean, it, it just makes no sense. Employers with under 25 full-time employees whose average income doesn't exceed 50K, I'm gonna tell you something right now. Look, this whole, we're all wealthy and small business, we make a million dollars, I'm gonna tell you right now, it's not happening. 95% of businesses are not millionaires, all right? 95% of businesses, when you really talk about what you have to reinvest in your business, aren't making $250,000 a year. That's not my income, right? That's what I'm judged on though, okay? Can apply for tax credits up to 30% for insuring their patients. Uh, I don't know about you guys, I love that word tax credit. Tax credit, I don't need it at the end of the year. I need it now. If I can't come up with that money every month, what good is a tax credit at the end of the year? It's crazy. Really, that doesn't help me any. I don't know about you guys, but that's just my personal experience. 10% tax on indoor tanning services. Blue Cross Blue Shield tax hike. Okay, that's why Blue Cross Blue Shield isn't any good in this state anymore. They used to be one of the best payers. We can't stand them no more. Excise tax on charitable hospitals which fail to comply with the requirements of Obamacare. Really? Really? You're going to go after the charitable hospitals? Oh, don't let them do any charity. Don't let them help the uninsured, right? They'll get penalized. Excise tax. 500000 annual executive compensation limit for health insurance executives. Now they're going to tell us how much we're allowed to get paid. That's a tax. You get taxed on if you pay, if you pay an executive of an insurance company over $500,000. Okay, medicine cabinet tax in effect over the counter medicines no longer qualified as medical expenses for flexible spending accounts, health reimbursement arrangements, health savings accounts, and Archer medical savings accounts. So over the counter medic medicines no longer qualified as medical expenses. <sighs> wow, looks like they took away a lot more than they gave. Elimination of tax deduction for employer provided retirement drug coverage in coordination with Medicare Part D. They even took that away. You wonder why your employer's having such a problem. We're not helping any. Wait till you see what they did with the states. Medicare tax on investment income, 3.8% over 200K or 250K for family. Uh, Medicare Part A increase of 0.9% over 200K or 250K. An annual $63. Every single person in this room gets an annual $63 fee levied by Obamacare on all plans to cover pre existing high risk pools. Do you all know that? That's not your copay. That's not your ed, your monthly amount. That's not your out of pocket. You get sixty three extra dollars added to all that every single year, and that may go up in the future. Yeah, probably. You're absolutely right. Maybe no may. <laughs> um, the medical deduction threshold tax increase in 2013 threshold to deduct medical expenses as an itemized deduction increases 10 percent to 10% from 7.5%. Oh, thank you so much at the end of the year, again, after you tax me on everything else. So, taxes on medical device manufacturers, $25 billion. Health insurance companies, $100 billion. Drug companies, $34 billion. Have we paid for it yet? And Medicare cuts, to boot. Yep, there we are. We're next to the big hairy guy. I murdered 12 people, what are you in for? I didn't buy health insurance. You know, 
they're, they're, they're looking at us and trying to scare us into submission. Here's the very interesting part. Most people don't know this, okay? First of all, let's talk about the penalties. For individual, uh, there's a tax penalty for people that don't get insurance, okay? For individuals, the penalty starts at $95 a year. That sounds like a pretty good deal. I'll pay my $95 a year. Wait, or up to 1% of your income, I can guarantee you <laughs> that the 1% is what you're going to get. Whichever is greater and rise to $695 or 2.5% of your income by 2016. And that keeps going up. Okay, they only got it rated out so far. You know, when they start collecting all that money that they're spending on turtles crossing the street, that they're going to want more money for that. Then they're going to want it not just for the baby turtles, but for the big turtles too. Right? For families, the tax will be 2085 or 2.5% 2 of household income, whichever is greater. The requirement can be waived for several reasons, including financial hardship or religious beliefs. So, if the tax would exceed 8% of your income, you are exempt. Also, some religious groups are exempt. The tax cannot exceed the cost of a bronze plan bought on the exchange. Okay, so if you bought an uh, uh, exchange bronze plan, which I'll show you in a minute what that bronze plan costs. Okay, so you know what? You did kind of got to go like this. Here's the one thing I have to tell you. For the individual mandate, for those of you that think that the IRS, with all of their new agents that they've hired, can come to your house, rap on your door, hand you a bill, and say, pay or you're going to be sitting next to the hairy guy. Okay? They can't do that. You know what they have access to do? Take your tax refund. I don't know about y'all, but I haven't gotten a tax refund and I can't tell you how long. So I think I'm pretty safe. They cannot come and knock on your door to collect this money. Insurance coverage options. There's the employer provided insurance coverage. Again, you know, that's, that's the employer, what, what we get now, right? You're still going to have that option. Now, this is what they say you're going to have. I can tell you far less of us are going to have employer, employer coverage. Okay, and you, would, you, won't, you will not believe how much your employer pays for your insurance. You would not believe. You wait till you get your first bill. I'm going to tell you, you're going to wish you went back to that employer because you're not going to want to be on an exchange. You're going to be paying 100%. Yeah, that's exactly right. Anybody ever deal with COBRA? That's exactly how you know what they pay. You know what? You're lucky if you pay a quarter of your insurance premium per month. 86% of us had employers pay it. I don't want to pay by myself. I want my employer to pay. Exactly. We're going to love our employers a lot more. But you know what? They can't afford it. They can't afford It's much easier for them to pay the fine, right? Government insurance option. Oh, can't wait. You know what? We deal, especially those of us in the industry. Oh, yeah, I think I'll have that Medicaid thing. <laughs> really? I mean, we know what happens, right? Oh, and I just can't wait to retire, although I think that we are headed towards the fact that none of us will ever retire, so we're, we're pretty safe there. Individual insurance coverage options, so direct enrollment, again, fewer of those. And uninsured population health exchange, so that's going to be the uninsured people or the people that pay the fines and stuff like that. They're your categories, right? That's your mechanisms now. Well, you know what? It really is a shopper's dream. This is what the exchanges were set up to do, okay? Now, I've got to tell you, don't look at the statistics because they're completely bogus. We know darn well 29 million people did nothing, right? We're lucky if we got 8 million. We have no clue how many of those people actually paid a premium. And of those people that paid the premium, wait until they see what their deductible is. Wait until they see what their copay is. Wait until they see what their actual premium is going to be next month. And guess what? It hadn't even been raised yet. I can assure you, they're not paying for that second payment. Okay? Because most of it is going to be more expensive for all of us. There's no help. A health insurance exchange is responsible for overseeing the sale and purchase of health insurance mainly for people outside of the employer sponsored market. I got to tell you something, that's about to expand tremendously. <laughs> it's about to get a lot bigger. Okay? Can't compare it to today. You got to compare it to the fact that most of, a lot of those employers will be going to somebody else. Obamacare recommends implementing a health insurance exchange, though it isn't mandated, mandated. Three options available for the health insurance exchanges, which we already have these, okay? So all of the states had to set it up, and it had to be either a state exchange that was set up, a state and federal exchange, which is a combined effort, or a federal exchange, okay? So there's three ways for you to set, it, set up your, based on your state. This is what it looks like now, okay? This is today. Look how many are federal. You know, most people went, you know what, I've already
already seen what administrative means to the government, right? OIG, Medicare, oh yeah, I just can't wait. You know what, I can't wait to set it up the way that I think it should be done right, and you come tell me I ain't right. And I've invested all that money. So a far larger amount of the states actually went with the federal. They said, let the federal set it up, let the federal deal with it, we're not gonna deal with it. Partnership marketplaces, there are seven states, you can see the colors there, and state-based marketplaces. Although, look at what's happening to the state-based ones. A lot of them are going to the federal. You know why? Because they couldn't make it. They didn't have enough people sign up, and that they've lost millions. Some of them 350 to $400 million in just setting up the exchange. Okay? And now it's, it went bankrupt or whatever, and now they had to go on the federal. So there's far more federal. The reason that I'm saying that is because it's pretty interesting. I'm going to talk to you in a second about um, a court decision that was just made in the last two weeks in Washington, D.C., and it's regarding the language within the Affordable Care Act based on what we get our uh, incentives back or whatever they call them, I, there's a word for it, where you get the money back to pay for your health insurance after you pay through the year. And there's, there's a language issue in the Affordable Care Act right now that's probably gonna go to the Supreme Court. And I'm gonna tell you, there will be no subsidies if, if they end up deciding. Because it only covers, the subsidies only cover, based on the language right now in the ACA, only covers state exchanges. How many state exchanges were there? How many did I just say went bankrupt and went to federal? So 27 federal would not, re, would not uh, be approved for subsidies at all. <laughs> Okay? So, and, and a, basically a state court just said that. So it'll probably go to the Supreme Court. Well, that right there would collapse under its weight. There's absolutely no way that Obamacare could exist without being able to provide that money back to those people they've promised it to. But in their language, they said, state exchanges only get subsidies. Of course, now we're trying to explain what that really means. Because I can't read. <laughs> I don't know what it means, right? And it changes, right? That's a moving target too. The law itself, 2,200 pages it started out as a moving target. Medicaid expansion and federal subsidies are designed, are designed to provide affordable insurance to the uninsured. 87% of all people who signed up on exchanges will receive federal subsidies. Again, 87%. So if that doesn't go through, right, it has to be a state exchange. If they say, hey, the language is the language is the language, it won't go through. Government covers 50%. This is the Medicaid expansion issue. So many people are, are really bashing some of the governors for not expanding Medicaid. I absolutely scoff at that. And I'll tell you why I do. And we're, in this state, we did not expand the Medicaid program. First of all, it's very difficult to get Medicaid in this state compared to a lot of the other states. That's not a bad thing, okay? Because you have to meet certain criteria. But the government covers right now under Medicaid, the government covers 50%, Medicaid, and, and uh, the state covers 50%, okay? ACA offer from the government is to pay 100% of the cost until 2020, okay? But after 2020, now remember how many people signed up for Medicaid? Almost out of 8 million people that signed up, we don't know if they've paid or not. More than 4.5 million of those people are on Medicaid. So if we had expanded our Medicaid program already, it, this hadn't even been implemented 100%, look what it would have done. Because by 2020, we have to pay 10% and the government will pay 90% if they expand Medicaid, okay? That, remember, the criteria to get Medicaid now is much higher. Wait till you see, you know what, now you can be a family of four. I'm, now I'm just, let's all laugh together. The expansion is, you can get on Medicaid now if you make $100,000 a year for a family of four. That's the eligibility. I don't know. Government attempted to penalize states who chose not to expand Medicaid by not funding. They actually took them to court. They took the doses of us, <laughs> the Floridas, and they said, you know what? We're not going to give you any Medicaid funds. We're not going to pay the 50% anymore. Unless you fall into line, went to court, the government lost. They said, you can't do that. You can't make people do it. You gotta, if they want to expand it, they can expand it. But if they don't want to, you can't force them to by threatening them, which is exactly what happened. More than half people who signed up for the exchanges are covered by Medicaid. The government pays no administrative cost for these new enrollees. Well, what kills the doctor? The administrative costs. Okay, wait till you see what they did to these programs too. So look at the increase in Medicaid population under the Obamacare, okay? 40 to 70%. Look at all the states. Here we are. That's the expansion. 
According to figures from the Congressional Budget Office, Medicaid enrollment will grow from the current 36 million or 13 percent of the population to 18. I'm going to tell you right now, it just grew bigger than that with the exchange and look at the muck up of the exchange. More people are on Medicaid and signed up for Medicaid than any other policy in the exchanges. Medicaid expansion. So the average federal cost of enrolling an adult in Medicaid under expanded ACA rules will be about 3,677 in 2014 higher than the 2,132 federal cost for enrollees under pre-ACA rules, but significantly lower than the 6,348 average federal cost to subsidize individuals who enroll in the exchanges rather than in Medicaid. Medicaid is the single largest component of state expenditures, I'm sorry, not 20%, 23.5% of the 1.7 trillion spent by states in 2013. Now, if that quadruples, we, if we have, and, and we're very strict here, so let me, let me just be very clear here. We did the right thing, okay? Medicaid expansion decisions, there they are. We're not moving forward. Oh, 21 states decided not to move forward. Look at that. So the federal exchanges aren't set up much different than the way, you know, they went with the same concept, bronze, Silver, gold, this is what the exchanges look like. Each plan offers levels of coverage, platinum, gold, silver, bronze, same rules as the commercial sector that we knew before, right? In other words, if you pay for a platinum, you pay more out of pocket, more of this, more of that, but I'm gonna give you the lowest amount you would pay if you got the bronze plan, okay? Subsidies primarily are in the silver plan category, okay? Most people are signing up for the silver plan. Okay, platinum plans come with the highest premiums but lowest out of pocket. That's not un unusual for even private payers before. Bronze plans carry lower monthly charges but require more cost sharing. Gold and silver fall in line in the middle. So again, that's not much different. Look at those prices. Oh yeah, I can afford, you know, I didn't have insurance before, but I can afford $262.15 for my premium now on a bronze plan, which means I probably got a $15,000 deductible. I'm not kidding. I'm really not kidding. The lowest deductible that you can find is 2,500. Most average deductibles under the exchange are 5,500 to $10,000. I see a lot of $10,000. Now, let me tell you something. Of course you see a lot because you know what? They go, well, I'm paying so much less for insurance. And I'm like, you wait until you see what you pay out of pocket before they even start paying. So here's my point. Here, here's my guideline. Look, I go to the doctor once a year. I go to my OBGYN because I'm on hormones. I know you couldn't tell. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. I'm on hormones, so I have to get my prescription refilled. That's all I go for. That's 189 bucks a year. All right, I would pay that in one month just for my premium, not to include the fact that I would never spend $10,000 in a year. So that means the insurance is never going to pay for me, right? Unless you get really Unless you're in a major medical. Unless you're in a major accident. If you're no pre-existing. Here's my whole point. If there's no pre-existing now, why would people not wait just until they get sick? We've just encouraged people, just, I ain't gonna pay for that. All I pay for is my hormones and my OBGYN every month. Look at the federal poverty levels. <coughs> Household size of one, your federal po poverty level is 11,490, 15,510 for two, 19,000. Now that's the lowest. Cost premium is for a health exchange family of four. Look at my federal poverty level, so that's 400%. Income level is $88,200, percent of income 9.5%, max annual premium $8,379, monthly premium $698. I don't know. Let me just tell you, I just told you I wasn't going to spend $8,379 in a year, right? And then they're telling the employers, if you spend over $10,500 for the people that are willing to pay for those Cadillac plans, we're going to charge you daggone 40%. I mean, it's just crazy. Look at the 300%. I mean, nobody pays less than this, and that is the lowest poverty level I just showed you. Okay, now, again, you know, Walmart can compete here because if it's $49 on my monthly premium for the lowest, that's still $9 more than what, met, what Walmart says they're going to do, right? But do I still have to have insurance? Are they going to be the administrators for that insurance? Are they going to file my claims? Are they going to do all the things we do in our careers every day? And, and, oh, by the way, you know, just to mention this one thing, quality. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, how do you think that's going to go for us? The bronze, look at this. They don't even pay as well as the, as the private. The bronze pays only 60% of your insurance costs. Listen, folks, 
if you're paying $268 a month, okay, that's already more than I'm paying, okay, and then you have a $10,000 out of pocket deductible, okay, okay, and then, by the way, if you hit that $10,000, we're only going to pay 60%. That's you pay 40%, that's the lowest plan. And that's affordable. That's affordable. Of course it is. Come on, get with the program, girl. Those evil insurance companies, you know, they were a million dollars a month, right? And we got to get rid of all those employers that paid. How dare they pay most of your insurance? Are you kidding? That's horrible. And you know what? Stop working 40 hours a week, folks. Just work 30. What the heck? You know? Yeah, that's really going to spur growth in economic. It's going to spur growth in businesses. Oh, it's definitely going to have more doctors go into business. Oh, can't wait. You know, you don't pay me jack crap for anything. And now all the people that are on these, they pay worse than Medicare pays. And you're paying way more out of pocket. Is that amazing? Look at that. Wow. New Medicaid enrollees plans. Okay, if I'm Medicaid, right, look, out of pocket limit for the individual. So everybody has to pay. That means the limit. That means you can cap at 5,000. Oh, wow. Thank you. I appreciate that better than 10. <laughs> Medicaid, still out of pocket cap is 59.50. Out of pocket limit to families is 11,900. Oh, of course, I can afford that, you know, for my family of four. I just can't wait till my son starts going to the dentist more frequently now. Oh, by the way, this does not cover dental and, and eyeglasses and all the other things that none of us get anything paid for. They all have to be separate policies, right? Essential coverage benefit, yes, and percent service plan. Look, again, bronze, they still only pay 60, 70, 80, and 90. Okay, wow, really? Are you kidding me? I don't know. It looks so affordable to me, I can't see straight. I should have left my glasses off. Additional out-of-pocket expenses, deductibles, co-pays, patient responsibility. You're responsible for 40% on everything. Annual caps on out-of-pocket costs. So you give me a cap of 5000 yeah, well, you know what? I'd rather have my $189 daggone visit that I pay self-pay for my OBGYN. Thank you very much. And $10 to Walgreens to get my prescription refilled. Why would I pay all that money? Now, I want to tell you, you remember all of the things that we were listening to about this? Oh, here's the numbers, right? You can't tell me who's paid. How many of you are having, I'm telling you, all my classes are telling me this. I teach coding classes, and I have people that work in the industry. And all of my classes are telling me this, you know what? Real life scenarios, folks. Patients are coming in, nobody has a card. There's a 90 day grace period. What, what are we gonna do, see them for free? Here's, here's the data that they're giving us. Look at this, website call and center traffic. Oh yeah, that's really important to me. You know, how many people called? Love it. Eligibility determination, 6.7 million Americans were notified of their eligibility. Does that mean they paid? Does that mean they signed up? Over 8 million have selected, selected a marketplace plan. Did they pay? Did they come back? Did they leave it in the cart? I mean, really? That's their statistics, all right? So this is where they're getting their 8 million people signed up for insurance. Now remember when they say that, they say signed up. You know what we hear? Paid. You know what the people that don't know anything about our industry? Paid. Oh, there's all those new people who weren't doing something great. And you know what? This is what percentage are 18 to 39 is paid for. And we'll only have to take now 300 billion more out of the Medicare program. But don't you worry, because Granny's going to be just fine. Look at this. Of 8 million people, they could tell us this. 46% are males. 28% are between the ages of 18 and 34. I'm going to tell you right now, when they get their bill, that's going down to zero. There ain't no 18-year-old on this planet that's going to pay $300 a month. They want a new cell phone. Okay, get with the program. 65% have selected a silver tier plan. Now, that's not even the lowest premium. Okay, now when they get their first bill, what do you think they're going to do? And 85% have selected a plan with financial assistance. Guess who all those people are that signed up that'll stick with it? The six million people that lost their insurance that paid before. Increased benefit price. No pre-existing condition rejections. Children on patients plan. This is all the goodies. No caps on annual benefits. No caps on life. You know what? How in the heck are you going to, when you haven't even paid for it to begin with, we're paying out of our pocket. How can you make no cap on lifetime benefits or no cap on annual benefits? Right? But they'll charge a 40% tax on an employer. Okay. 
No rescission, so you can't cancel coverage once they have coverage. Is it, I don't think you're gonna have to worry about that because I think they'll cancel yeah, it themselves. Yeah, they'll just stop paying. Yeah, they'll just stop paying. Tighter medical loss ratios for insurance. Look at this. Uh, other insurers rebate to policyholders 80 to 85% on cost on medical benefits. So 80 to 85% cannot be administrative costs for the payer. If they pay more than that, more than 85%, say 90%, right? If they pay above the cap, the insurance company has to pay back the federal government as a subsidy. Okay, so that means 80 to 85 percent of what they produce, the insurance payers, has to be medically related. It can't include administrative costs. What's it cost to run a business today in healthcare? All right, even in insurance companies, guys, they're not as evil as we've made them out to be. We're, we're all kind of evil at this point, right? Obamacare health exchange minimum requirements. Here's a look. We pay for, you have to pay, all the insurers have to pay for ambulatory pay, uh, pay, patient services, emergency services, like that's a big gimme. You've had to pay for emergency services from day one. Can somebody in here define to me what an emergency is? What is justification for me to go into the emergency room? What's an emergency? Define emergency. Loss of life or limb. Loss of life or limb? Mm -hmm. You know what the real rule is? The real rule is the patient's perception of what's an emergency. So you know what, that drug seat and patient that needs to just get another refill, that's an emergency to them. You have to see them, legally. Maternity and newborn care, mental health and substance abuse, prescription drugs, rehab services, lab services, preventative, pediatric, including oral and vision care. Look at that, there's all your goodies. Federal subsidies, the federal government will offer premium subsidies to those with incomes up to four times the federal poverty level. Look at that. Subsidies to people who make $94,200 a year for a family of four. The government's going to give us money back. Now, again, I can't wait till the end of the year. I don't know about you all, but you just saw what we're going to pay during the year. How much do you think you'll get back? And how many times has the government done what they said they were going to do? Well, subsidies, guys, subsidies. So, again, remember, the court case right now going on is that the subsidies only go towards the state exchanges. Okay? That's what they're fighting right now. There will be additional help for cover of out-of-pocket for those earning less than 250,000 poverty line, 58,000 for a family of four, 28,000 for a single. The subsidies are tied to the cost of the state's silver level plans. Okay? So what if I get a bronze? What if I get a platinum? The state, did you see that? There's the, there it is right there. How big, uh, who was the lady before HHS? That just got canned, Sebelius. How big is the one that took her place? So it used to be Sebelius versus Burwell, right? This is the lawsuit. Lawsuit brought by three employers and four taxpayers alleging that subsidies should only be available in states that set up their own insurance exchanges because that's what the Affordable Care Act says. If government ultimately loses the case in the Supreme Court, it's possible that federal subsidies will no longer be available to make insurance affordable in over 30 states. No subsidies. Here's what the ACA language says. Enrolled in through an exchange established by the state. Is that clear to you? I said, but, but we didn't mean that. We meant all of them. You know what happened is they thought all the states were going to get their own exchanges. Additional effects, mandated implementation of medical records. You know, ACA mandated me electronic medical records. 5010, ICD-10, all those uh, new F and W things. Mandated implementation of relative value modifier to enable physician payments on quality metrics. Yeah, how quality? Well, yep, there is a target on our back. Sorry. Various uh, expanded regulatory compliance and disclosure. ACA requires physicians to actively identify possible Stark Law violations, design self-disclosure protocols. Physician, these are all new. Physician payment sunshine passed with the ACA requires companies to record any physician payment over $10 in 2012 and begin reporting these amounts on March 31st. Pharmaceutical and medical device firms, anything over $10. Beginning in 2015, failure to participate in PQRI, which is the old, it's PQRS now, will result in a 1.5% reduction. Now you're mandated. You will get paid 1.5% less by Medicare if you do not participate in PQRS. Reductions in physician pay. Oh, didn't know that, did we? Accountable care organizations and bundled payment structures. 
ACOs, you know what? There's another whole presentation for that. But I'm going to tell you right now, equivalent of uh, HMO in the past, but Medicare will pay you less if you don't meet their requirement next year. They can pay you up to 1.5 to 2.5 eventually maybe less for Medicare, your payments, period, as if they're not low enough now, based on their idea of quality. Specialty physician providers may experience increased regulatory limitations on their practice under health care reform. That's already happening. Any of you that work for specialists know that. To date, more than 42 provisions of the law have been changed, canceled, or delayed. The hardship waiver, the employer mandate, keep insurance plan. We know that one didn't go through. Sign-up deadline, small group deductible cap eliminated. Medicare Advantage cuts were canceled because Medicare patients had such a fit. How are you paying for this? If all of this stuff hasn't even come through yet, insurer bailout funding increase, pre-existing condition insurance plan extension. Here's some more cost control. I'm done. This is it. Look, more cost control experiments. Oh, just anything that Medicare puts and says experiment, that scares me to death. Bundled payments in Medicare, hospital team of inpatient post-discharge providers lump payment to a team. So they're bundling payments and they're paying. It's just like an old HMO. Right? They're just trying to control everything, right? Independence at home demonstration where a team provides care in a home to a needy, needy chronically ill patient. Hospital of readmission reduction, pay for performance. Accountable care organizations, we already talked about that. Team paid fee for service with bonus for quality care. Quality care based on their rules, okay? Penalty if you don't meet the standards, they will pay you less if you don't meet those standards. So you share risk, basically. And comparative effectiveness, research supervised by Patient-Centered Outcome Research Institute, data-driven outcomes to track greatest savings and where process. Look, this is in addition to PQRS. This is in addition to RAC, or now called RAP. Uh, this is in addition to all of those other things that you guys are dealing with on a daily basis. So, I don't know. How do you think it looks? Make up your own mind. <laughs> is it a storm coming or is it a sunshiny road that you're going to be taking? But I'm not going to ask. I'm not going to tell you what my opinion is. I just produce facts. <laughs> hey, I, I don't know, but you know, at least I supported it with facts, right? At least you can say I supported it with facts. Do you know a little bit more about it now? How about a lot more about it? Yeah. Any questions? I know. Everybody's just going, oh, no. My thoughts on ICD-10 are this, is that... Um, and I'm just going to use another law, you know, this year that, that because of the fact of the um, SGR, but let's say what that is, it's uh, the caps on physician uh, payments. Uh, uh, that's been in place. This is the 18th year in a row that they've canceled that bill that went through 18 years ago. The affordable, I mean, the ICD-10 went under that umbrella. Okay. So when we're talking, and, and nobody even mentioned ICD-10, mm -hmm. I actually watched C-SPAN when that was going on. And the debate, they were just talking about the physician part of it, right? They just put that underneath it. Right under, yeah. They did. They and snuck it in. They snuck it in. They snuck it in. Nobody ever even said anything about it. Yeah. So my thought about ICD-10 is if it's up to the federal government, because remember, the mandate came through Affordable Care Act. So if it's up to the federal government, might be a little while. Might be a little while. Right? Because, I mean, if I've delayed the other one for 18 years, you know, a law is not a law is not a law, really. Any other questions? Thank you for joining us.